Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Eric Sparks and I'm going to be talk, talking to you about the Coastal Conservation and Restoration Program. Um, my email address is listed there, eric.sparks at msstate.edu, as well as the link to the Coastal Conservation and Restoration Program or collectively called CCR website down below my email address. This program um, is co-sponsored by Mississippi State University Extension Service as well as Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant Consortium. So I'm more of the talking head up here um, for a group of folks that do a lot of awesome work. Uh, this is a subset of the team that we have. It's a good mix of um, professionals, graduate students, um, and interns that, like I said, all do a, a lot of amazing work on a lot of different projects, which I'll touch on here in a little bit. Before I dive into the individual projects, I want to go over how we generally work. And given that we're an extension based or applied research um, program, we really try to focus on this cycle to make sure that what we're producing is very applicable and um, can be picked up by the target audience and used. So, first thing we start off with typically the needs assessment. Um, and that's where we just kind of gauge formally or informally what the research gaps are or educational needs are and then from there we search for information to see if it's already been addressed and if it has we move down to develop information transfer products but if it hasn't that's when we write grants and conduct applied research to address that need um, and then as i mentioned before we kind of go back down to the develop informational transfer products that can be peer reviewed literature or the um, more easy to understand extension products that come out of that get them out to folks and then assess whether they've been effective or not and then start the cycle all over again we have a couple different themes throughout the the ccr program um, but one of the major themes is marine debris and so i've just got a slide here showing a bunch of the different activities that we um, conduct involving marine debris and even inland litter. So we run the Mississippi Coastal Cleanup Program, which is focused on working in the coastal counties um, to prevent and remove litter and debris from our waterways and along beaches and things like that. So there's a lot of activities that go on with that from coordinating, you know, several thousand volunteers um, throughout the year to remove tons and tons of trash um, as well as doing a lot of educational programs. COVID obviously limited a lot of the in-person educational programs that we were doing but we're really gearing up for whenever we can kind of get back in front of kids and crowds to do some more education focused activities that aren't virtual. Some other activities that we do um, include research, which is in the bottom left um, photo there on accumulation rates of trash on the barrier islands. Um, in the top right, we do a citizen science, or we've been running a citizen science program focused on categorizing the number of microplastics on the beach beaches and in the water throughout the Gulf of Mexico. This is, was funded through the Gulf of Mexico Alliance. Other studies looking at microplastic concentrations in drinking water and factors that contribute to those being more or less. Um, and then kind of on the bottom right um, there, there's a photo of a litter trap out in the stream. We've recently started um, working with groups to determine kind of the ideal placement for these litter traps where they can have the most potential impact. Um, and then the bottom right corner, we've recently gotten a grant to develop the uh, Mississippi Inland Cleanup Program, which is kind of Mississippi Coastal Cleanup, but moved inland. And we've got a logo there with a raccoon and recycling symbol on it, but we're getting ready to get that kind of kicked off in the next year or so. And last but not least, and something I'll talk about later, is the box that has a yellow square around it. And that's our um, derelict crab trap removal program. So this one, we've, we're working with commercial shrimpers to to incentivize them to remove a lot of these abandoned crab traps, which we then recycle. Um, and then also working with them to collect research data to evaluate the impact of marine debris. I'll talk about that project a little more later. 
other, as I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of educational activities and um, a little bit less so this year, but in the past, you know, we've, we've done uh, things with all ages of folks. So we run the Mississippi Master Nationalist Program, which is focused on adult education and, and promoting environmental stewardship in that age group. Um, there's a certification course there followed by um, volunteer and service hour requirements to maintain your certification. Um, similarly, there's a Mississippi Student Naturalist Program uh, that's funded through the EPA for the development of it and it mirrors the Master Naturalist program except it's focused on ages 18 and below whereas Master Naturalist is 18 and up. We also have a grant called Planet Marsh. Um, this one's through the National Academy of Sciences to develop a wetland education uh, curriculum and actually build um, greenhouses at three schools here along the coastal counties and so we're, we're in the middle of that. The greenhouses are putting in, we're designing curriculum around that where the students can learn all about wetland plants and then whenever we can do field trips again we'll get out and we'll actually plant a lot of the plants that they grow in the greenhouses in true restoration projects and our other like main focus area here it probably takes up the majority of our time is focused on general coastal ecology and um, you know management associated with that the big box that's circled in yellow, that's living shorelines. And uh, I'm going to briefly talk about that a little later, but essentially those are alternative techniques to hardened structures like, like bulkheads. And um, they're known to be environmentally superior to those hardened structures. So they help provide a lot of habitat, um, a lot of ecosystem services or nature's benefits like removing pollution and things like that these um, living shorelines do, as well as hold short, their shoreline in place and provide those functions that folks want with their bulkhead, typically. So we're trying to do a lot of activities to get that those off the ground. Um, kind of moving to the other side of the slide here, you can see the little photos of shrimp and crabs and things like that. We do a lot of research work evaluating uh, the effectiveness of living shorelines as well as our coastal ecosystems such as seagrass um, or or submerged aquatic vegetation at providing these services and we, we need to know this um, info where we can design our conservation and restoration projects in a way that um, benefits everything as much as possible and so we actively work with all the state and federal resource agencies to make sure that this information gets transferred to them. The top right corner, we've um, developed our own wave gauges, low cost wave gauges to help improve the design of these shoreline projects like the living shoreline ones that I mentioned earlier and um, seems like something that's relatively trivial but that rep those gauges represent about a 20 times cost savings over commercial models which makes it a lot more applicable and appealing for researchers and state resource managers alike to be able to collect this information, which is probably, wave energy is probably the predominant driver for the different types of designs you should use for any type of shoreline project. So um, that's been, those have been used in nine states, at least nine states, as well as um, two other countries that we know of so far. So they've been picked up and used um, pretty widely already. I have a project with the Department of Marine Resources looking at the viability of clam aquaculture in near shore waters. Um, and then we're recently, or we're about to start a project looking at the impacts of uh, coastal upland habitat management on bat activity as well as insect abundance. Um, and we do, it, we incorporate drones uh, into a lot of this work, and that's where the picture of the drones in the bottom right. Um, we obviously get pretty pictures with them, but also. Um, use those photos as well as collect a lot of other information that's needed to um, further our research and application goals. So along the living shoreline theme, uh, one thing that we've been doing a lot of lately is um, property owner site assessment. So this photo here is from a bulkhead um, that was destroyed in Gautier. Uh, with a category one storm. This property owner had just spent $75,000 putting this in 
was blown away in an instant. And you can look around this property in areas that are just kind of natural marsh, more like that living shoreline type, um, are doing okay. So, um, and also providing a lot of those environmental benefits that we know and love. So we go out, we do these assessments, we fly the drone, we get elevation profiles um, and all of that. And then we'll come back and make suggestions or recommendations for um, things that they should consider or, you know, figures they can take to contractors. And then they can work from there to nail down designs. And additionally, we're training the contractors at the same time. so. It's like we're working, uh, can't burn in a candle from both ends here. Uh, this photo is from property in Gulf Shores where three property owners are going together to build a uh, living shoreline project to revegetate their shoreline there and hold it in place. Um, when we go out and do these site assessments, again, we use the, the drone. Um, that middle photo on the right uh, with the yellow pole with the white thing on top of it, that's called a RTK. GPS, it basically measures elevation um, very accurately as well as position. So you can use this to, to calculate the amount of dirt that you need, you need for fill on a project and things like that. So we're providing a lot of information um, to the property owner or contractor that um, will significantly help with the construction of these projects um, as well as collecting wave energy too whenever we need it. So. All that we use to develop those rough sketches, give them to the property owner, and then they run from there on implementing projects. One thing that we have noticed um, that's very, um, it kind of blurs a couple fields here, something we're not an expert at is growing flowers, but a lot of these property owners, they love the idea of living shoreline projects. It's just the vegetation we have around here, the dominant vegetation isn't the prettiest in the world. They really want something that flowers. Um, and I can't say that I blame them, they're just for the aesthetic. So if you look at the photo on the right with the, the ladies using that RTK GPS, that's the native vegetation that we have along the shoreline. Black needle rush and um, Spartina alternate flora behind it. But there are some little patches or a little, um, couple little plants between there that do produce these flowers and so we're trying to learn to and work with folks like master gardener group to learn how to propagate these flowering native wetland plants and incorporate those in designs because i think it'll help um, with property owners choosing a living shoreline project over a more traditional hardened structure the last project i'm going to talk about in detail i referenced earlier was that uh, when we're working with commercial shrimpers um, to incentivize them to remove crab traps and also help um, calculate the economic impact of marine debris. So this is a dual like stewardship and research project. So when a, a commercial shrimper pulls up a crab trap, it's a pretty major ordeal for them. Um, they spend a lot of time untangling the nets uh, and a lot of times it causes gear. But in a, in a nutshell, like lost time is lost money for these shrimpers because there's only so much time in a day that they can go out there and pull those nets. Um, these things also damage gear as well as a, a myriad of other impacts, um, like displacing catch is another one. And it's not just crab traps, it's a lot of other trash that we have out in the environment that directly impacts the shrimp fishery, not from an ecological standpoint, but also an economic standpoint and, you know, the lines that blur between those. So we have a student looking directly at this and should be graduating this semester and have her results fully analyzed and published by then. So we should have a good idea of what the actual impacts are here. So with that, um, I'll take any questions or comments you may have. Feel free to just email them directly to me at eric.sparks at msstate.edu. If you want to check out um, the Coastal Conservation and Restoration website, visit it at coastal.msstate.edu backslash ccr. We also have, you know, all the social media platforms that you want. If you want to follow us on there, that's a little bit quicker way to um, hear about what's going on in our group too. Um, in addition to the email, that always works. With that, thank you, and um, yeah, be in touch.